So Richard Duncan has agreed to uh, come to Brazil and speak uh, to us tonight. He's been traveling around a lot. He did uh, Santiago in Chile on Monday, Montevideo on Tuesday, Buenos Aires yesterday, last night, and today he's here. So traveling a lot. After, after Sao Paulo, in a week's time, he's going to be in the uh, capital of Latin America, which is Miami. Um, he's going to be there on the 17th of August. Uh, tonight we have the presentation, How to Understand Economics and Financial Markets in the Post-Bretton Woods, Woods World. Uh, Richard is the author of three books on the global economic crisis. One is The Dollar Crisis, Causes, Consequences and Cures. The other is The Corruption of Capitalism. And the third one is The New Depression, The Breakdown of the Paper Money Economy, which is this one that I have in my hand. This one right here. Uh, we have lots of copies over there. These copies will be uh, handed out to you. Uh, at the end of his presentation, he's going to do a book signing. So if you wait out until the end of the presentation, right after the presentation, Richard is going to be there signing the books. Let me just uh, talk a little bit more about Richard. He uh, began his career as an equities analyst in Hong Kong in 1986, uh, served as a global head of investment strategy at ABNM Asset Management in London, worked as a financial sector specialist for the World Bank in, in Washington, D.C., and headed the equity research department uh, at James Capel Securities and Salomon Brothers in Bangkok, where he lives now. He also worked as a consultant for the IMF in Thailand during the Asia crisis. He is now a consultant and speaker on issues related to the global economic crisis, and he's also the publisher of Macro Watch, which is a video newsletter dedicated to analyzing and forecasting trends in global macro and their impact on the financial markets. If you want to check out his news, uh, his video newsletter, you can go to richardduncaneconomics.com. Okay, so without further ado, Richard Duncan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight to listen to me talking about economics and the financial markets in the post Bretton Woods world. I'm very happy to be here. This is my first time in Brazil. Um, and so I would like to thank the CFA Society for inviting me. Okay, so what I would like to talk to you tonight about is I've spent most of the last 30 years living in Asia, Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, a few times each. And during those three decades, Asia was completely transformed um, in a way that would not have been at all possible if, if the world had remained on a Bretton Woods system. We have experienced nothing less than a revolution in monetary affairs as a result of the collapse of the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system in 1971. <coughs> the world economy works very differently now than it did under the Bretton Woods system or under the gold standard before the Bretton Woods system. So once the Bretton Woods system broke down, trade imbalances and capital flows between nations became enormous. Credit growth accelerated sharply and central banks began creating money on an extraordinary scale. Tonight, I'll begin by describing the evolution of the global economy after the breakdown of Bretton Woods. Then I'll discuss the tools now available to policymakers in this new environment and how those tools are being used to manage the economy. Next, I'll discuss how investors can anticipate movements in currencies, commodity prices, asset prices in this new regime. And finally, I'll talk about the dangers and also the opportunities that exist in this new post Bretton Woods world. Right, so now to understand how the global economy works now, is a good starting point is to understand how it used to work under a gold standard or the Bretton Woods system, which was a quasi gold standard. It's very different now. First, the gold standard had an automatic adjustment mechanism that prevented large trade imbalances between countries. Back then, there were no massive trade deficits. Now, the United States, at one point, the trade deficit of the U.S. was $800 billion in 2006. Under the Bretton Woods system, trade balanced. Under the gold standard, trade balanced. Let me give you an example and explain why. Take England and France at the end of the 19th century. If England had a very big trade deficit with France, 
for example, then England's gold would literally have been put on a ship and sent over to France. So gold was money, so England would have had less money. So England's economy would have contracted sharply. There would have been sharp increase in unemployment, and there would have been deflation. And the opposite would have happened in France. France would have had more money, so credit would have expanded, the economy would have boomed, there would have been more employment, and there would have been more inflation. And pretty soon, the rich French would start buying more cheap English goods, and the poor unemployed English would stop buying so many expensive French goods, and trade would come into balance. That's the way trade worked up until 1971. And it's easy to understand. If you spend all of your money, if you spend all of your gold, and you don't have any more gold left, so you can't buy anything and you're poor, uh, and you stop buying things from other countries. So trade balance. There was an automatic adjustment mechanism. Well, that's, that is no, no longer the case. So the, the gold standard itself broke down in World War I. In 1914, all the European countries went to war with each other. They didn't have enough gold to fight the war, so they started printing a lot of paper money to finance the government bonds that bought the weapons. And that was the end of the classical gold standard. They tried to patch it up after the war in the 20s, and, but it didn't work. And then there was World War II. And at the end of World War II, they, they still wanted to go back to a gold standard because that's really all they understood, all they knew. But there was one big problem. The U.S. had almost all the world's gold. So you can't have an international trading system based on gold when only one country has the gold. So they created the Bretton Woods system instead, which replicated this automatic adjustment mechanism, among other things. And under that system, dollars were pegged to gold at $35 an ounce, and all the other currencies were also pegged to gold or pegged to the dollar. And that's how it worked. And it worked pretty well for about 25 years. Okay, now I'll come back to that in a second, but there's a second crucial difference between the way the world works now and the way the world worked then. Then money literally had to be backed by gold. Central bank was not free to print as much money as it wanted. It could only issue currency if it had gold to back the currency. So the U.S. Central Bank, Fed, when it was founded, it was required to have at least 40% gold backing for every dollar that it issued. Later, that was reduced to 25% in 1945. Well, of course, that's no longer the case either. All right, so this shows U.S. gold reserves going back to 1948. You can see during the 1960s, the U.S. gold reserves fell by half. And that happened because the U.S. government was spending too much money on the Vietnam War, so a lot of dollars were going into Asia, and also because U.S. banks and corporations were investing a lot in Europe, and they were sending a lot of dollars into Europe. And under the Bretton Woods system, other countries had the right to take their dollars and to convert them into U.S. gold at $35 an ounce. So as these dollars went into Europe, into France, for instance, the French in particular were very quick to take their dollars and get the U.S. gold. And so that's why the gold reserves fell by half. And by 1971, there were four times as many dollars overseas as the U.S. actually had gold available to convert into. So at that point, President Nixon reneged on the U.S. pledge to allow dollars to be converted into gold. And that was the end. He closed the gold window, they say. And that was the end of international convertibility. So this ratio shows at the end of World War II, the U.S. had, this is gold backing to currency. So the U.S. had almost 100% gold backing. The dollars were fully backed by U.S. gold. But by 1968, it was down to the legal limit of 25%. So we hit a point where the Fed was legally bound not to issue any more currency at all because it didn't have sufficient gold backing. President Johnson asked Congress to remove that requirement. Congress changed the law in 1968, and afterwards, so there was no longer any domestic gold backing whatsoever. No domestic gold backing, no international gold backing, no gold backing. We were on a pure fiat money system after that. So this is the dollars in circulation. This is 1968 when they stopped backing the dollars with gold, 
And you can see how much money has been, how much paper dollars has, have been created since then. It's roughly $1.6 trillion now. So okay, that, obviously that's a big increase. But in the big scheme of things, $1.6 trillion is really kind of small change. What really mattered was this explosion in credit. Once we stopped backing dollars with gold, credit absolutely exploded. Now what I mean by total debt is equal to total credit. One person's debt is another person's asset. So when I talk, I use them interchangeably, total debt, total, total credit. But what I mean by total debt is all the debt in the United States. Government debt, household sector debt, corporate debt, financial sector debt, all the debt. It first went through $1 trillion in 1964, when I was three years old. 43 years later, it has increased 50 times to $50 trillion. So a 50-fold expansion in 43 years. And then it started to dip and the world almost collapsed into a new depression. But, as I'll show you, governments borrowed a lot and it expanded now to $66 trillion. So this explosion of credit created the world we live in. It changed everything. The ratio of total debt to GDP, this goes back to 1951, for a long time it was around 150% debt to GDP. But then President Reagan was elected and started running big budget deficits, and it started climbing. And at the peak, it was 370% of GDP. So credit was growing much more rapidly than the economy. In fact, it was the credit growth that was driving the economic growth. It's easy to understand when you have very rapid credit growth, the economy grows. If, you, if everyone gets a new credit card in the mailbox every month, they go out and spend money. So the Corporations make more profits, they hire more people, they build new buildings, and everything's good as long as the credit keeps expanding. The problem is, is ultimately, we get to the point where the people don't have enough income to repay the debt, and that's when the bubble starts to pop. And that's what happened in 2008. Now, this shows the current account deficit. It's more or less, we can say, the trade deficit. Now, as I mentioned earlier, under the Bretton Woods system, trade balance and under the gold standard. But when Bretton Woods broke down, it didn't take the Americans very long, 1980, to discover that they could start buying things from other countries and they didn't have to pay with gold anymore. They could pay with paper dollars or treasury bonds denominated in paper dollars. And there was no limit as to how many of these they could create. So this doesn't look very big in, in the mid 80s compared to that. But this was 3.5% of U.S. GDP, which was extraordinarily large and extraordinarily destabilizing. Global policymakers were horrified. The deficit was primarily with Germany and Japan in particular. So Japan then was like France in my earlier example. It had this trade surplus. It wasn't being paid with gold, but it was being paid with dollars, and the dollars were more or less as good as gold. The dollars were exogenous to Japan's economy. So they went into Japan, they went into Japan's banks as deposits and caused rapid deposit growth. So that forced the Japanese banks to have rapid loan growth, and so the economy boomed. But the U.S., unlike England, did not deflate and stop buying because, as I said, they, they had a limitless supply of paper money that they could create. So the U.S., Japan's trade surplus kept getting larger, and so Japan's economy boomed and boomed and boomed and boomed until in 1989, the gardens around the Imperial Palace in Tokyo were more valuable than California. And then the bubble popped. So that's why Japan blew into a bubble. Now at this point, uh, the policymakers met at the Plaza Hotel in New York and reached the Plaza Accord, which effectively agreed that the dollar would be devalued by 50% against the mark and the yen. And that was enough to bring trade back into balance. But this was just the, the early days of globalization. I got to Hong Kong here. And um, so very quickly, China entered the global economy. And the US trade deficit started becoming very much larger again. In 19, I was in Bangkok between 1990 and 1996. You'll remember in 97, that was the Asia crisis. Thai, bubbles in Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Korea. 
Well, so I was managing a very large re equities research department there, looking at all the industries and all the listed companies, and you could see these companies were, you could look out the window and see hundreds of cranes out of any window you looked out of. And it was clearly a, unsustainable, but it wasn't just property. Every industry was quadrupling its capacity, and it clearly was a bubble, uh, a, just a, a mind-bogglingly large bubble. It, it, surely it was going to end badly, and it did. And I, finally, I left in 96, but in 97 it popped. And, when it, and in 98, the Thailand economy shrank by 10%, and the Thai stock market fell 95% in dollar terms. So I always say that's where I had my education in bubblenomics. That's how I learned how the bubbles work. So a lot of foreign money comes into a country. It goes into the banking system. That forces the banks to lend. They lend and lend, everything gets better, and everyone's happy, and then there's not enough money to repay the credit, and it all implodes. So that was, the, that was 97. Then this became larger and larger. By the way, this little dip was when the NASDAQ bubble popped in, 2000, in 2001, and that was a pretty hard on the global economy, just this little dip. By 2008, Six, the trade deficit was $800 billion that year. That was $2 million a, a minute, or 6% of US GDP that year. So obviously, as, with, as long as this becomes larger, when, obviously when the US has an $800 billion deficit, the rest of the world has an $800 billion surplus. So this was the driver of global economic growth. Between 1980 and here, the cumulative deficit was $7 trillion, meaning that the rest of the world was able to produce and sell $7 trillion worth of goods that they would not have been able to do had we remained on the Bretton Woods system. And these were financed with, with debt. So this ushered in the age of globalization and allowed China to be transformed. But again, then in 2000. And Eight, the Americans couldn't repay the debt, and they stopped importing so much. This corrected, and the global economy came close to collapsing into depression. Okay, now what this chart shows is total foreign exchange reserves. What are foreign exchange reserves? Okay, they're they're held by bank uh, central banks and only central banks. It peaked at twelve trillion dollars in 2014. Twelve trillion. So let me go through how this works. And I'll use China as an example because China had the most foreign exchange reserves. They had $4 trillion at the peak. So last year, China's trade surplus with the US last year was about $350 billion. Yeah, $350 billion, a third of a trillion. So Chinese exporters take their goods to the United States, they sell them, they get paid in dollars. They want to take the dollars back to China and convert them into RMB. But if they bought $350 billion worth of RMB in the free market, and of course the RMB would skyrocket, and this would kill China's export-led growth and cause their economy to stop growing or to go into severe recession. So in order to prevent that currency appreciation from happening, the central bank buys all of these dollars, $350 billion, at more or less a fixed exchange rate. So the exporters get to do anything they want with their money. They convert it into RMB, and they can do anything they want with it, but sooner or later, it goes into the banking system, causes rapid deposit growth, rapid loan growth, the boom, and ultimately the bust. But the point here is the central bank. Last year, they ended up with another $350 billion this way. Well, the pertinent question is, where did they get the equivalent of $350 billion worth of RMB that they use to buy the dollars? Well, the answer, of course, is they're a central bank. They have a magic wand, they wave it around, and poof, they've got $350 billion worth of RMB. So, what this chart is telling, what this chart shows us, this is China plus every, all the other trade surplus, all the central banks in the world, but this increased from $2 trillion in the year 2000 to $12 trillion in 2014. So this shows us $10 trillion of, foreign, of fiat money creation in a dozen years or so. 
This was paper money creation on a scale unlike anything the world had ever seen before, certainly not in peacetime. It dwarfs the amount of quantitative easing that the Fed has done so far. The Fed has only, only printed three and a half trillion. This was three times that amount. So this combination of these massive U.S. trade deficits fueling global demand and this paper money creation in order to perpetuate this regime, those two things combined led to a worldwide economic boom. And that boom literally pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty around the world. The problem is it resulted in economic bubbles in both the surplus countries and in the deficit country. The surplus countries experienced an economic boom and inflation in asset prices, just as they would have under the gold standard, as I explained with Japan. But the deficit country, primarily the U.S., didn't deflate because they weren't paying with gold. And so every country, I've been talking about trade deficits. But, and trade surpluses. Japan had a big trade surplus, and that's why it was blown into a bubble. China has a big trade surplus, that's why it's been blown into a bubble. Thailand, where I live, they actually had a trade deficit. But they had so much money coming in on the capital and financial account that it not only covered their trade deficit, it also resulted in a very big overall balance of payments surplus. So it's not really just a trade surplus, it can be a surplus on the, it's an overall surplus however it occurs on the capital and finance, on the overall balance of payments that results in the bubbles forming. So this, once Bretton Woods start, broke down, this has happened all around the world. During the 1970s, many of the Latin American countries were blown into bubbles through the recycling of the petrodollars. The oil money went into the Middle East. They didn't have any place to put it. They gave it to the American banks. The American banks gave it to Mexico, and Mexico bubbled in boom. Brazil, too, I believe. Then Japan in the 80s, then the Asian crisis countries in the 90s, and then now China ever since. But the deficit country was also blown into a bubble. And here's how. So this is the, the, the current account deficit that we've been looking at. This is the 800 billion deficit in 2006. What this shows us is the balance of payments. Every country's balance of payments has to balance. So when the US has an 800 billion dollar trade deficit, it will have and did have an $800 billion surplus on the financial and capital account. Balance of payments has to balance. So it's like a family. If a family spends more money than it earns, it either has to borrow money or it has to sell something. And so the larger the U.S. trade deficit became, the more money came flooding into the United States. And this money flooding the U.S. went into Treasury bonds and pushed up their price and drove down the interest rates. Now, at this point, 1987, Plaza Accord, this current account deficit started correcting. And so less capital started coming into the United States suddenly. What happened then? Stock market fell 23% one night. I believe that was because of this correction in the amount of money flowing in from abroad. And here at the peak, when the deficit peaked, the capital inflows peaked, that's when we got the property bubble. Now, so, I, it's useful to compare the capital inflows coming into the country with the amount of money that the government borrows to finance its budget deficit. If, how large is the budget deficit compared to these capital inflows? That tells us a lot about where this money goes. The money would like to go into government bonds. And that's what I show here in this chart. This goes back to 1990. So the red bar is government borrowing. And the blue bar are the, the capital inflows, speaking at 800 billion in 2006. Government borrowing, more or less the, the budget deficit, with the signs reversed. So starting in 1997, the capital inflows were, became significantly larger than the amount, total amount of government borrowing. And for the next 12 years, the capital inflows were much larger than the government borrowing. So here, this is a negative number because the U.S. actually had a budget surplus for a couple of years. 
So the U.S. government wasn't issuing any new bonds. In fact, they were retiring the old bonds that they had already issued in the past. But meanwhile, there was $400 billion of foreign capital coming into the United States looking to be invested in U.S. government bonds, and there were no new bonds being issued. And so where did that money go? Well, it went into Fannie and Freddie bonds, it went into corporate bonds, and money is fungible, so it went <laughs> everywhere, but it, that's when we got the NASDAQ bubble. Now, if you take this and, and deduct this, then you can see this is how much excess liquidity there is. And that's what I'll show you in the next chart. This gives us a liquidity gauge. It's the capital inflows minus the government borrowing. And here, 2000, when the government was paying down the debt, we had very large excess liquidity and got the NASDAQ bubble. And again, in 2006, another surge of excess liquidity produced, blew the U.S. into a bubble, the property bubble. Okay, now this chart shows, these are quarterly data points, but it shows from 1991, the increase in household borrowing each year. Not the total household borrowing, but the increase in household borrowing. So for five years, on average, U.S. households increased their borrowing by $1 trillion a year. Interest rates were falling, Americans borrowed more and more, they spent more and more, so the U.S. imported more and more, so the rest of the world exported more and more. But then everything blew up in 2008. So, Now, what I described, this pattern, is very similar, sim similar to what happened during the, the Great Depression. In my view, the Great Depression originated in 1914, when the gold standard broke down in World War I. All the governments fighting the war issued a lot of government debt, issued a lot of paper money to pay the debt, all of this new debt and paper money led to a worldwide credit bubble that we call the Roaring Twenties. But in 1930, the credit couldn't be repaid, and the international banking system broke down, and international trade collapsed. And at that point, the policymakers did not have a clue about what to do. They were capitalists, they believed in laissez-faire and market forces, and they more or less just stepped back and didn't do anything much. And Market forces worked. Market forces did reestablish a new market-determined equilibrium. But that equilibrium was at a level of GDP that was 46% less than it was in 1929. GDP fell by half. Unemployment went to 25%. Trade barriers went up. Global trade collapsed. And the de depression began. And it lasted for a decade. And during that decade, Nazi Germany took over Europe. A militarized Japan took over Asia. And then World War II started, and 60 million people died. Okay, the pattern this time has been very similar up until the time of the policy response. The Bretton Woods system, a kind of gold standard, broke down in 1971. The government started issuing a lot of debt and increasing amounts of paper money. We have a three-decade-long global boom. But in 2008, that boom turns to bust when the credit can't be repaid. The international banking system starts to collapse. Global trade starts to collapse. But this time, instead of letting market forces work, the governments do absolutely everything in their power to prevent market forces from working. They intervene very aggressively with extremely aggressive fiscal policy and an extremely aggressive monetary policy, and they reflate the bubble. Now, back in the 1930s, the Fed did do some quantitative easing. They printed $1.7 billion between 29 and 33. That was 2.5% of GDP. 2.5% of GDP. Uh, but that was too little, too late. 25% of all the banks failed. Total credit contracted by 39%. Unemployment went to 25%. Now, the reason the Fed did not act more aggressively, they could have pushed interest rates to zero, but they had a constraint. If they pushed interest rates to zero in the U.S. and interest rates in France were 3%, then all the gold would have left the United States and gone to France, and there would have been no gold to back the dollars. 
and they were legally required to back the dollar. So they were constrained by, what they say, golden fetters, and that prevented them from having a more aggressive monetary policy. So this time, it was a different story altogether. When the crisis hit this time, the U.S. government started running trillion-dollar budget deficits. This was 10% of U.S. GDP. And whereas in the 1930s, even though the tax revenues were collapsing, the government actually tried to balance the budget in the 30s, a disastrous policy. And they cut interest rates. The federal funds rate was cut to zero, and it stayed there for eight or nine years. Uh, and again, they couldn't have done this. They didn't have to worry this time about gold leaving the U.S., because the money was no longer pegged to gold. Gold was irrelevant. And the Fed printed three and a half trillion dollars in three rounds of quantitative easing. And when they printed the money, they used the money to buy financial assets, government bonds and man bonds backed by Fannie and Freddie. And whoever they bought the bonds from, they had three and a half trillion dollars that they had to invest somewhere else, like the stock market. So this time it was a much bigger scale. This time the Fed printed three and a half trillion dollars. That was 20% of GDP. So it was 10 times more paper money printing this time. Okay, in the three rounds of quantitative easing, this is the S&P 500 stock market index. It was crashing in 2008. Then they start QE1 and it goes up. They stop QE1, it goes down. So they start QE2, it goes up. They stop QE2, it goes down. And then they get really aggressive with QE3 and it goes up and up and up and up. This is until 2015. And as the stock prices went up, the household sector net worth, in other words, the wealth, this is all the assets of the Americans, mostly property and stocks and pensions, it went up. It went up by $40 trillion from 2009. It went up 73% from here to today. And this explosion of this wealth creation, I will produced a wealth effect that allowed the Americans to buy more and spend more and the United States to import more and the rest of the world to export more. This shows U.S. government debt going back to 1900 as a percent of GDP. So as a percent of GDP, this was World War I, this was the Depression, this was World War II, more than 100% government debt to GDP. They pay down the debt. Reagan gets elected, starts running big budget deficits. It becomes higher again. Clinton has budget surpluses. And then this is the crisis. The government debt doubles during the crisis. Okay, so the, the red bars show the government borrowing, the budget deficits. And the green bars show the quantitative easing, how much the Fed prints. So this year, the Fed printed enough to buy all the government debt. And during these years, up until they stopped in 2014, they printed enough to finance 52% of all the government debt during those years. So you can say that the Fed monetized half the debt, and that allowed the government to have these trillion dollar budget deficits and finance them at extremely low interest rates, which would not have been possible without the monetization of the debt by the Fed printing and buying the government bonds. So this combination of extremely aggressive fiscal and monetary policy worked marvelously. It was, it miraculously reflated the bubble. Um, interest rates fell to record low levels, and that stimulated the economy. The large budget deficit stimulated the economy, and the Fed bought three and a half trillion dollars worth of assets from people who then had three and a half trillion dollars that they had to invest in other assets, pushing up the net worth, net, net wealth. So the mass bank failures were prevented, and credit continued to expand, and the economy began to grow again. So a new Great Depression was prevented in a way that would not have been possible under the Bretton Woods system or the gold standard. So this policy worked because it stopped credit from contracting, and then it started making credit expand again. So these policies reflated the global economic bubble. Now, I believe that the most important thing to understand about economics in the 21st century is that credit growth drives economic growth. If credit doesn't expand, the economy doesn't grow. 
and if credit contracts, the economy goes into severe, severe recession or depression. Credit growth drives economic growth. So I like to say that our economic system has evolved. We have evolved from capitalism into creditism. Under creditism, under capitalism, capitalism was an economic system driven by investment and savings. Businessmen would invest, some of them would make a profit, they would save that profit, or in other words, accumulate capital, hence capitalism, and repeat. It was slow and difficult. But our economic system works in an entirely different way now. Our system is driven by credit creation and consumption, more credit creation and more consumption. And that's a whole lot easier. The problem is, is creditism demands credit growth to survive. And we've hit the point now where the private sector is so heavily indebted relative to their income that they can't keep borrowing. So creditism is in crisis. What we have here is going back to 1952, two bars. The red bar is GDP growth. The blue bar is credit growth adjusted for inflation. So the credit growth minus the inflation rate. Now, the point is, any time credit grows by less than 2%, the U.S. goes into recession. This happened nine times. Every time credit grew by less than 2%, the U.S. went into recession. And the recession didn't end until we got a new big surge of credit expansion, the way we did under President Reagan, because of his large budget deficits. So we need at least 2% credit growth to keep the U.S. from going into recession. Or else we need some sort of extraordinary monetary stimulus like quantitative easing. So credit growth drives economic growth, and 2% adjusted for inflation is the recession threshold. The problem is now we have $66 trillion of debt. So if we assume 2% inflation, then it has to grow by 4%. 4% of $66 trillion is $2.5 trillion. It's very hard to get anyone to borrow $2.5 trillion every year. These are the main sectors of the economy that could potentially borrow. The black bar, this is the government's debt from 2006. It doubled. When the crisis struck, the government borrowed an extra $10 trillion, and that's why the credit didn't contract. All the other sectors reduced. This is household borrowing. This is corporate borrowing, borrowing by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, non-corporate business and state and local government. If you make educated guesses about how much each one of these sectors is going to borrow, which is not very difficult to do, you can project how much total credit is going to grow by. And this is what I did. Last year it grew by 2.7%. This year I think it's only going to grow by 2%. And next year by 1.9%. So that's below the recession threshold. If history is any guide, then the U.S. is going to go back into recession without some extraordinary monetary stimulus. So it's yes, not enough. So at this point, Keep the global bubble inflated. The governments around the world are managing the economy by making credit grow and by making asset prices inflate. And interest rates are the key to controlling both credit growth and asset price inflation. And central banks manage the global economy through their control over interest rates. Now, QE in the United States ended in October 2014, but it's still going on very aggressively in Japan and Europe. The Japanese are printing the equivalent of $61 billion every month, and the European Central Bank is printing the equivalent of $67 billion every month and buying bonds with it. So that pushes up their bond prices, it pushes down their bond yields, and that holds down U.S. bond yields as well. This shows the balance sheets of these central banks. Here's the total assets of the Fed increased by 3.5 trillion. The ECB's balance sheet is increasing. The Bank of Japan is increasing very rapidly. And here's the Bank of England. So those four central banks have created, combined, they've created $10 trillion in the last 10 years. $10 trillion. That increased their assets by 270%. Of course, that would not have been possible under the gold standard, because you had to have that amount of gold, which no one does. So here again, 
The DOJ is creating 61 billion, ECB 67, that's per month. So per quarter, almost $400 billion are still being created and pumped into the global economy by those two central banks alone. Now, so the Bank of Japan has acquired almost $4 trillion of Japanese government bonds. The ECB has acquired $2.2 trillion. The Bank of England, $600 billion. The U.S. has $2.5 billion of government bonds, plus another $1.7 trillion of Fannie Mae and Freddie, ba Freddie Mac bonds. So these four central banks have something that's getting close to $9.2 trillion of government bonds have been bought by these four central banks. So the Bank of Japan now owns 36% of all Japanese government debt. The ECB owns 23% of all Euro area debt. BOE, the Bank of England, owns 25% of all UK government debt. And the Fed owns 12% of U.S. government debt, plus some $1.7 trillion of bonds by issued by Fannie and Freddie. So, now, this, this is really quite extraordinary. Um, because what this suggests to me, so let me show you this chart. I always like to say it's amazing how much money you can make when you make the money. So what this chart shows is the profits of the Fed. Last year the Fed made $92 billion. And when the Fed, at the end of every year, the Fed takes all of its profits and gives it to the government. So since 2009, the Fed has given the government nearly $700 billion. In some years, this reduced the U.S. budget deficit by 20%. Now, I believe that we should view these bonds. These bonds have effectively been canceled. As long as these central banks never sell these bonds, and as long as they keep rolling them over when they mature, then these bonds will never cost taxpayers a cent. They have effectively been eliminated. Because again, at the end of every year, the Treasury Department, for instance, in the U.S., it does have to pay interest on the bonds to the Fed, but the Fed takes all the interest and gives it right back to the Treasury Department, effectively meaning these bonds aren't paying any interest. So what this suggests is that the Bank of Japan has already canceled a more than a third of U U Japanese government debt. England's canceled a quarter, and so is Europe. And these two continue to cancel more and more every month. So this means that the world government debt is far less than it appears to be. And in fact, this debt will never cause any problems at all in the future as long as the governments never sell it, and as long as they keep rolling it over when it matures. You know, the big taboo has already been, has been broken. The taboo was printing the money to start with. Uh, but they did that. Everyone knows that central banks are not supposed to print money. But they've just printed $10 trillion. So they've already broken the taboo. There's no point now for them to reverse it, unwind it. Why should they sell these bonds back to the public and make them uncanceled? It's entirely pointless. They should permanently cancel this debt. Now, so a, a, a monetary, a money revolution has occurred before our eyes over the last 30 years. The, the phase one of this revolution was the boom period. Between 1971 and 2007, the trade surplus countries printed $6 trillion to manipulate their currency. And then after the crisis struck, they printed another $6 trillion. And then as we saw, phase two was when that bubble started to pop, these four central banks printed $10 trillion and reflated it. So combined, all of those central banks had created $22 trillion, most of it since the crisis started. To put that in, number into context, that's larger than all the U.S. government debt. So phase one, the boom period, that money printing pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Then the bubble started to pop, so phase two, they reflated the bubble. 
and it has worked. So far, so good. Nine years now, since 2008. So, okay, this was supposed to have caused hyperinflation. Why didn't it? Well, it didn't because of globalization. Globalization is extremely deflationary. Two billion people live on less than three dollars a day. So you no longer have to hire someone in Michigan and pay that person two hundred dollars a day with benefits. You, your next manufacturer, your car worker, can be hired in Guangdong province for ten dollars a day. So the, your, the marginal cost of labor has dropped ninety percent. Your next worker will cost ninety percent less than your last worker. Nothing like this has occurred in history. It's extraordinarily deflationary, putting downward pressure on wages in the U.S. and Europe and Japan. And this deflationary pressure is completely offsetting all of the inflationary pressure from the paper money printing, resulting in no inflation and a lot of stimulus and no depression. So a lot of people are, have been worried that this is going to blow up at any time. This can't go on. This defies the laws of fundamental economics. Something evil must be going on. But I wouldn't wait, I wouldn't hold your breath waiting for all of this to explode. For instance, this shows Japan's government debt to GDP. When their, their bubble popped 27 years ago in 1990, at that time, in 1990, Japan's government had 60% government debt to GDP. But as the bubble started heading into depression, they started running very large budget deficits every year. And so the level, and that, the, that stimulus kept Japan's economy from collapsing into a depression. But now they have 250% government debt to GDP. If you don't take into consideration the 36% that the Bank of Japan has already canceled. But uh, leaving that aside, this suggests for well, the U.S. government only has 100% government debt to GDP. The U.S. GDP is $19 trillion in size. So that suggests the U.S. government could borrow and spend another $19 trillion over the next, let's say, 10 years before it even hit 200% government debt to GDP. And that assumes 0% GDP growth. Whereas if the government really does spend $19 trillion, the economy is going to grow by 10% every year, and we're never going to hit 200% government debt to GDP. So this arrangement, as long as the government's willing to borrow and spend, and as long as there's globalization that prevents the deflation, then this can go on for decades. Unless the government does something stupid, which of course cannot be ruled out by any means. So what are the risks of all of this new world we live in? Well, the biggest risk is that higher interest rates would cause credit to contract and asset prices to fall, and that would cause a very serious global recession or depression. Here, this goes back to 1980. The blue line, interest rates, 10-year government bond yields, the yield on 10-year government bonds. In 1980, a government bond yielded 15%. Now it yields 2.3%. So as interest rates came down, it made borrowing cheaper. So the Americans were able to borrow more. So this ratio of debt to GDP went from 150% to 370%. And so the credit growth drove the economic growth. Now, however, if the interest rates move up, credit is going to contract, and it's going to tip the U.S. into very severe recession or depression. So this is why interest rates are so key. It would cause credit to contract. Now, what could cause interest rates to move higher? Well, quantitative easing could cause interest rates to go higher. The Fed is now planning to begin to reverse quantitative easing. So the reverse of quantitative easing is quantitative tightening. Now, quantitative easing, as we've discussed, pushed up asset prices and reflated the global economy. So logic su suggests that if they begin selling these bonds off, they're going to suck liquidity out of the markets, and asset prices are going to go down, and the economy is going to start going into recession. And they've even provided us the schedule of what this tightening would look like. They're going to do it gradually. And it could begin as early as next month. That's what they were suggesting a couple of months ago anyway. So here's the schedule. When it begins in the first month, they're going to contract their assets by $10 billion the first month, and the second, and the third. 
but then 20 billion, and the fourth, fifth, sixth, and then 30 billion, and then after nine months, 40. And by the 13th month, they'll be reducing their balance sheet, their assets, by $50 billion every month. And they're going to continue doing that until they believe their balance sheet has been normalized. Well, this is what their balance sheet will look like if they actually do that. By the end of 2019, their, balance, their assets will be $1 trillion less. That will reduce their assets by 23%. That would be extreme monetary tightening. The financial markets should be horrified, terrified, petrified. This is, would have very, this would suck a trillion dollars out of the financial markets. Uh, it won't be pretty if it actually happens. Will it actually happen? No, I don't think it will. When they get going just a little bit, the stock market's going to panic, it's going to drop 10%, and then the Fed will stop. And if things get out of control and the stock market drops 20%, then the Fed will launch another round of quantitative easing and push it back up, because they must make asset prices keep going higher, and they must make credit continue to expand. But this is what they're telling us they're going to do, and if they do it, it will certainly make interest rates go much higher, which would cause credit to contract and asset prices to fall in a severe recession in the U.S. and globally. Now, the next risk, President Trump's economic policies. Well. We don't know for certain what he's going to do, or for that matter, how much longer he will actually be President Trump. But if he does what he says he's going to do, it is a recipe for disaster. What he said he was going to do is cut taxes and increase government spending on the military and on infrastructure. So if you have lower income and more spending, you have much larger budget deficits. The budget deficit is already $500 billion. This could blow it out to a trillion dollars a year. Now, on top of that, he's also promised to eliminate the trade deficit. Now, the trade deficit is also about $500 billion, as we saw earlier, which means that there are $500 billion of capital inflow as a result of those deficits. So the capital inflows of $500 billion are now enough to finance the entire U.S. government budget deficit. But if you eliminate these capital inflows and you double the size of the budget deficit, an interest rate, you're going to have to borrow a lot more money domestically, and that's going to push up interest rates sharply. And on top of that, he's also pledged to put up tariffs on Chinese and Mexican goods, 40% tariffs on Mexican goods, on Chinese goods. Well, if you put a 40% tariff on Chinese goods, then suddenly everything in Walmart costs 20, 40% more, and inflation immediately spikes to 8%, 10-year bond yield spikes to 10%, the game's over. So hopefully he won't do any of that. He's been backing away from some of that, and, uh, but that's what he promised to do. If he does, it will be uh, a disaster. Now, a couple of points. China, and then the stronger dollar, and then I'll wrap up. China. China is having a, beginning to have an economic crisis. China has enjoyed the greatest economic boom in history. Their economy went from 12% the size of GDP, U.S. GDP in 2000. Now it's about 65% the size of the U.S. GDP. So it's ca catching up very quickly. And how did this happen? It happened because of the trade surplus China has with the United States. In 1990, China was a very poor third world country because it had no trade surplus with the U.S. Now it's a third of a trillion dollars every year. This trade surplus is the thing that completely transformed China. They take some of these dollars. These are all dollars that they're accumulating every year. They have a few choices. They can use all these dollars to buy U.S. government bonds and finance American wars, or they can stockpile copper and iron ore. So they're doing some of both. They're stockpiling a lot of commodities so they don't have to buy so many government bonds. Those are basically their options. Take the dollars and buy copper. Take the dollars and buy government bonds. Now... We always knew that China's economy in percent terms has been growing much more rapidly than the U.S. economy. But this shows in dollar terms. Once the crisis started, China's economy has been growing more in absolute dollar terms than the U.S. economy has been, much more. So the U.S. is no longer the main driver of growth. China has become the main driver of global growth. So this whole boom was driven by investment. This chart shows that China increased its level of investment, fixed capital formation every year, expanded by 50 times between 1990 and 2014. 
50 times. But now they have massive excess capacity of everything. For instance, cement production. It increased 12 times between 1990 and 2014. In three years, 2011, 2012, 2013, China produced more cement than the United States did during the entire 20th century. Now, if they do the same thing for the next three years, there's zero growth in the cement industry. So they have massive excess capacity, of not only of cement, but it's the same story for steel and all the other industries as well. And this was financed by credit, of course. Total credit expanded nine times between 2002 and 2015. But now credit is slowing, so economic growth is slowing. Last year it took 13% credit growth to get 6% economic growth. But the credit base is twice as large as the economy. So that meant they actually had to 15 trillion RMB worth of credit just to get 4 trillion worth of economic growth. So all of this credit is being increasingly misallocated and will never be repaid. The investments they're making are not profitable and never will be. And the problem is that in China, the median income is $8 a day. So the people working in the Chinese factories don't earn enough money to buy the things that they're making. In the past, they just sold all the surplus to the Americans and the Europeans, but now the U.S. is in crisis, Europe is in crisis, Japan is in crisis. There's a huge political backlash. Donald Trump was elected on the promise to stop this. So this is not going to continue. So there's no domestic demand, there's no global demand, there is no demand. The more they invest, the more losses they accumulate, the more bankrupt their bankrupt banks become. So China's economy could stop growing just like Japan's did. Japan's economy is no larger today than it was in 1993. When I first moved to Asia, everyone could tell you exactly when Japan's economy was going to become the biggest in the world. Well, that didn't happen. And if China does stop growing, then of course commodity prices are going to fall sharply. And so the currents of the emerging markets economies are going to fall resulting in potentially a new emerging market debt crisis. Corporate profits will, stop, will suffer, causing a global stock market sell-off and a severe economic downturn. And that's just no growth. There's a real possibility China could have a bad recession, in which case we could easily tip into a global depression. Now the dollar. Between, between mid-2014 and March 2015, the dollar went up 22%. And that had very harmful results for everyone. Um, commodity prices fell, so the currency of the commodity producing countries fell, global trade contracted. We had a mild, but not so mild, global recession as a result of this. And why did this happen? It happened because of diverging monetary policy. In 2014, the Fed stopped printing dollars, but the Bank of Japan and the ECB were still printing very aggressively. So whoever prints the most loses in terms of their currency. If you print a lot, your currency is going to depreciate. Fed stopped printing, the other countries didn't, so it was monetary policy divergence, the dollar got stronger. Now, this shows what will be the, the monetary policy divergence again if the Fed really does go through with QT. This projects out to 2019, the assets of the central bank. This will be extreme monetary tightening this is the Bank of Japan, with, there's, no, there's, there's no end in sight to their QE program. The ECB will probably taper next year and then stop, but it will still expand. So right now China is the largest central bank in the world in terms of assets, but it looks like it's going to be overtaken by both the Bank of Japan and the, East, and the European Central Bank. And so the yen should fall very sharply, the dollar should strengthen very sharply, and if it does, we're going to experience all the same problems again falling commodity prices, falling currencies for the commodity producing countries, falling profits, bad stock markets. So let's hope that it doesn't get too carried away with this. So now, just to wrap up a couple of things, how to anticipate movements in currencies, commodity prices, and asset prices. Okay, well, as we've just been discussing, commodity prices are driven by the dollar. If the dollar goes up, commodity prices go down. The dollar goes up, gold goes down, oil goes down, copper goes down. Currencies are determined by interest rate differentials, as we were just discussing. Whoever prints the most loses. 
and asset prices. Asset prices go up when interest rates go down. And when interest rates go up, asset prices go down. If interest rates go up, the property market falls because it becomes more expensive to borrow. So all three of these, commodities, currencies, and asset prices, are driven by interest rates and interest rate differentials. And interest rates are determined by monetary policy. And monetary policy is dictated by the necessity to make the economy continue to grow by causing credit to expand and by causing asset prices to inflate. So how to understand economics in the financial markets in the post Bretton Woods world? Well, first and foremost, know that credit growth drives economic growth. Credit doesn't expand, the economy goes into recession. Governments, primarily the central banks, are managing the economy to make sure that credit does continue to expand. And if credit becomes too weak, then the economy goes into recession. If credit contracts, then the economy goes into depression. And central banks will do whatever is necessary to prevent that from happening. Quantitative easing is how central banks will keep the interest rates low during the years ahead. So the next time the U.S. starts to go into recession, you should anticipate there will be QE4. And QE works best when it's combined with very aggressive fiscal stimulus also. So that's why you, the governments are managing the economy. We have a government-directed creditism. That's how the financial markets work in the age of paper money. So I'll, I've gone over significantly, so I'll stop there. But I hope that in the Q&A session, someone will ask me about the opportunities that exist within this new economic system of ours. Because I know up until now I've been kind of depressing. But if someone will ask me what are the opportunities, then we can end on an uplifting note of more optimism. So I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> And my first, thank you. So it seems like during the gold standard and the Bretton Woods era, growth was driven by mundane things like population growth, uh, productivity growth. Well, during this latest era, growth has been driven by credit growth. I mean, economic growth has been driven by credit growth, right? So don't you fear that this model, this current model you're describing is basically exhausted? I mean, even if you exclude the fact that, you know, the, the debt that's held by the central bank being canceled, the rest of the debt is still very high, very, very high that you can argue it's stifling growth. And is there a potential? I mean, how would that play out? Well, so I think that we've hit the limits on the private sector side. The private sector can't take on very much more debt because their income is not increasing. But on the government side, at least not every government in the world, but certainly the U.S. government, and probably the European government, and the U.K. government, the major economies, they have the potential to take on much more debt. As I was saying earlier, Japan has 250% government debt to GDP. So a lot of people believe that in Austrian economics, Austrian economics teach us that credit creates an artificial boom and that the boom must pop, the bo bubble must, we must pay for our sins. And, suffer uh, for our mistakes, but um, in reality, we've already, as you can see, for the last nine years now, the bubble started to pop nine years ago, but it didn't pop. It got reflated by government borrowing, and so this could go, they, they say we're just kicking the can down the road. Well, I'm all in favor of kicking the can as far down the road as possible. I mean, they've done it for nine years, let's do it for another nine, or, or 18, or 30. 30 would work very well for me, I reckon. So, if this bubble pops, I mean, let's think what would be the consequences if this bubble pops. We saw what happened in the, in the 30s. It would be the same sort of thing. If there's no government intervention, to, to, if we take the Austrian approach and just let markets clear, if we'd done that in 2008, then all of the banks in the world would have failed. And all of the savings in those banks would have been destroyed. Unemployment, once again, would have gone up to 25%, so there would have been trade tariffs, globalization would have collapsed, China's economy would have gone into complete depression, with tens of millions of Chinese people unemployed. In the United States, U.S. tax revenues would collapse, and in Europe, so there would no longer be enough income, tax, tax revenues to finance Social Security or Medicare, 
so the old people would be hungry again. And there would not be enough money for military bases around the world. So the U.S. would have to pull back the military and would have global political chaos. So that's what happens if the bubble popped. Our civilization might not survive it. Therefore, we must keep the bubble inflated, and we have the tools to keep it inflated if only our policymakers recognize this. But if they put up trade barriers, then that's the end of the story, because then we have inflation, and interest rates go higher, credit contracts, the bubble pops. So this only works with globalization. Okay, my uh, microphone didn't work before, so I just wanted to uh, say thank you, Richard, for an excellent presentation. Of course, we're going to continue with the Q&A. Uh, just as a reminder, Richard will be signing the books, which we're going to hand out to you as a courtesy of uh, CFA Society Brazil as soon as uh, we're done here with the Q&A. And of course, uh, this might take a little bit of time, so of course we'll have the uh, cocktail reception. So please join us for the cocktail, cocktail reception right after the Q&A session. And I do have what would be the first question that I... <laughs> my mic didn't work. So globalization is deflationary, as you, uh, as you said, Richard. And, um, uh, wages are going down, as you said, globally. Um, and that's uh, that's a reflection of uh, you know what we're seeing in the past several decades. But wages are sticky, as far as we know from you know some what some bad economists taught us in the past. In Brazil, we're just implementing new labor laws or new labor law, uh, but still we have it's it's a well known fact that in Brazil wages are very sticky. You cannot, for example, lower the salary of you know, an employee. Um, and you know all sorts of problems that uh, arise from from that fact. So, so in that scenario where wages are going down globally, how can we how can Brazil compete? And to come back to your point, what are the opportunities for Brazil to compete in this globalized world? Given that you know uh, you know everything you mentioned, including uh, deflation, is happening everywhere. Okay, well I'm by no means an expert on Brazil's economy, but from what I understand. Brazil has quite high trade tariffs, so Brazil is not really fully affected by globalization the way that the United States is. U.S. wages have certainly gone down in, they have been flat at best in absolute terms since the early 1970s, and of course in relative terms they have fallen behind even further. So there's more income inequality in the U.S. now than ever before. And as a result of this globalization, all the U.S. factories left. And so all of the unions were destroyed. And this depressed the income, but they were all given cheap mortgages and cheap credit cards so they could keep spending anyway, and that supported their lifestyle. So they didn't completely panic until the bubble popped, and now they're panicking, and that's why they elected Trump. It's a big backlash against globalization. So if Brazil were fully exposed to Chinese exports uh, without tariffs, your labor unions wouldn't last a minute. Um, your factories would disappear just like the U.S. factories did. So it's probably a very good idea to keep the tariffs and keep the jobs and keep the industry here. Now I know it's, Brazil is very dependent and South America in general on demand now from China. So there's just no escaping the consequences. If China goes into severe recession, there's no getting around it. So I don't know what Brazil can do in particular to, uh, to, to grow in that sort of environment. But I think it would be a mistake to do what the U.S. has done and remove all the trade barriers and let your factories and your industries disappear. And you know, I know too much unionization is a bad thing, but too little unionization is also a bad thing. You, don't, you have to have, you have, consumption makes up 70% of most economies. If your wages don't increase, you can't consume. If you're, so you need industry, um, and U.S. industry is gone now. So I wouldn't make that mistake. Yes, my, my question is about <clears throat> the Fed's announced intention to start shrinking its balance sheet. As you've rightly pointed out, uh, this might mean uh, perhaps a financial crash. Uh, so my question is, one, why do you think the Fed is insisting on such a mistaken and serious idea, a wrong idea? And number two, do you think this idea, this idea can be stopped dead in its tracks uh, once there is a change at the top of the Fed by the beginning of next year, especially if the next chairman is someone from the financial sector, 
such as Mr. Gary Gon. Okay, well, I think there are two reasons the Fed may be doing this. I mean, the Fed wants the stock market to go up. The Fed ideally would like the stock market to go up maybe 5% a year. But, uh, but now it's already gone up more than 10% this year. So that's too much. The bubble is clearly overvalued. It's extremely expensive by past standards. So they're worried that a bubble is running out of control, and they're trying to put the brakes on the bubble. So that's one reason. And the other reason, I think, is that they would like to do a little bit of reverse quantitative easing, just a little bit, so they can say, look, this is not a permanent monetization of the debt. We've really re started reducing quantitative easing. So it will be easier for them to have the next round of quantitative easing the next time we have a recession. They'll meet less political resistance. They could say, hey, look, this isn't permanent. We're not really monetizing the debt. We're, we'll sell it one day, but they never will. And as, so I think, yes, anything's possible. Yellen is going to be replaced in February. Trump, no telling who he will replace that person with, but you would think he would want the economy to be revved up by loose monetary policy. So we'll see. He could put in a crony. Uh, we'll see. But now, before too many people leave, let me discuss the opportunities that exist within this new economic system, because I think this is very important. Um, we, Joseph Schumpeter, the great Austrian economist, wrote the, a book called Business Cycles, in which he said that economic growth was driven by waves of innovation, like railroads, and then chemicals, and then automobiles, and electricity. Well, I believe that we may be experiencing just such an innovation that we don't recognize what's occurring. Okay, printing money is not new. They've been printing money for a long, long time, usually with disastrous consequences. That's why they never want to print money. But now, what is new is globalization. What is new is this combination of printing money and globalization, because this is inflationary, this is deflationary, and it allows us to print money without having inflation. So let's think about this. Over the last nine years, history, the fact is, the U.S. government borrowed and spent $10 trillion that it didn't have. And that kept us from collapsing into a depression. And the Fed monetized a third of it. Now, how much longer is this going to go on? Is this going to suddenly stop tomorrow? I don't think so. Is it going to stop next year? Well, as long as we don't have trade tariffs, this arrangement could go on for a long, long time. If, what if it goes on for another 10 years? Let's think about the opportunities, the policy opportunities that this presents. What if the Bank of Japan really has canceled a third of its debt, and Europe and Japan a quarter? What if there is much less government debt than we now believe there is? And what if we can have more debt and cancel it as soon as we print it and stimulate the economy? This creates enormous opportunities for our global society. For instance, over the next 10 years, I believe the U.S. government could invest a trillion dollars in solar energy and a trillion dollars in genetic engineering and a trillion dollars in biotech and a trillion dollars in nanotech and probably another trillion in a couple of other industries over a 10-year period with a plan, starting with fundamental research and education and building it out. And this a trillion dollars is an enormous amount of money. You would create miracles if you spent that kind of money in an intelligent kind of way. Instead of spending it invading Iran, which would stimulate the economy and create a lot of new enemies and just all be wasted, uh, let's, let's have green energy and let's have a cancer cure. Okay, so the government could do this in a couple of different ways. They could do it like they did the NASA space program under one big roof in Alabama somewhere. That worked quite well. The government did all that. It wasn't wasteful. Maybe it was wasteful, but we got a lot of technology out of it. That's one opportunity. Most people hate that idea. So here's a more acceptable idea. The government could act as a big venture capital company. The government can borrow money at 2.3% interest. The Fed can monetize some of it. And the, they form, the government chooses the 10,000 most promising American entrepreneurs, and it forms joint venture capital companies. It forms joint venture companies with them, people like Elon Musk. The government funds these joint venture companies lavishly with this cheap or free money and keeps a 60% equity stake. And the entrepreneurs get the 
40% equity stake, and they manage the company. Okay, when one of these joint ventures comes up with a cancer cure, they list this company on NASDAQ for five or ten trillion dollars, with the U.S. taxpayers keeping 60%. This pays for itself many times over. In fact, it would probably reduce the entire government debt. And moreover, this would induce a technological revolution that would produce medical miracles and technological mar marvels. So, already we're on the cusp of an incredible technological leap forward. For instance, one of Google, Google Alphabet, Google, one of Alphabet's subsidiaries is a biotech research group that Google is funding very lavishly already. Their mission statement is to cure death. To cure death. So already it's possible to reverse aging in mice. These are things that have been accomplished. So if the government threw this enormous amounts of money, not only would we be able to grow our way out of this bubble that we're in now, not only could we avoid ever collapsing into a new Great Depression the way the Austrians tell us that we must, we could induce such an advance in our civilization. It would, be, it would enormously benefit everyone on the planet. Everyone would benefit. So we could potentially all live happily ever after, potentially for a very, very long time. In, in the U.S., Everyone's worried that the government's going to go bankrupt 30 years from now because of Social Security and health care cost. Well, rather than sitting and waiting for that to happen, here's another idea. Let's cure all the diseases. That's the sort of things that we can do. I mean, Microsoft, to Bill Gates, is curing malaria. Uh, we are on the cusp of eliminating, we could eliminate almost all the major diseases over the next 20 years. If, if the government provided enough funding. So that's the opportunity. I mean, if we've got free money, then let's think about how long it's going to go on and let's come up with a real serious plan on how we can invest this money and grow our way out of this crisis instead of wasting it all on unnecessary wars and too much consumption. So that's the opportunity. I think we should recognize what's going on around us. And that's what this post Bretton world, Woods world with globalization makes possible. It may not last. I mean, if, if trade barriers go up, then none of this is possible. But as long as trade barriers don't go up, then this could go on for a long time, and we should make the most of it while the sun shines. Hi. I got a question. It might be a little polemic. Do you believe there is a new gold standard that's rising with technology called digital coin, uh, digital currency? Do you believe without intermediaries, we have a new something not written or any books or any economic style that will have like a gold standard you used to have in a digital form? I don't think so. I mean, first of all, if we went back to anything with the gold standard characteristics that prevented trade imbalances, then the global economy would implode. And China sometimes says they don't like the, the dollar standard that we have now, and they would like something else, but they're not really telling the truth. They benefit enormously from this current arrangement where they can have a $350 billion trade surplus. If we went back to anything that looked like a gold standard, then the U.S. would only have so much of it. And after about six months, they wouldn't have any left because of their big trade deficit. And they wouldn't be able to buy one more pair of tennis shoes from China. So China's economy would collapse. So anything that takes us back to this automatic adjustment mechanism pops the global bubble right away. And as far as the cryptocurrencies, I, I'm not at all a believer. I mean, Bitcoin, uh, I don't understand why anybody... Well, Bitcoin was very useful for laundering drug money, but they seem to have cracked down on that. And it's very useful for the Chinese to get money out of China, but I'm sure that's not going to last either. I don't see why... Other than that, I don't see why anyone would have faith in Bitcoin, where these mysterious miners mine coins somehow on magic formula, and they grow at a certain rate. And You know, they, you could have Bitcoin... Point two, three, four, five. There's no limit as to how many Bitcoin companies could pop up. Why would you trust that instead of a regulated central bank? I'm not a believer in Bitcoin. Now, blockchain is a totally different story. I mean, that's probably going to revolutionize finance, but that doesn't have anything to do with being a cryptocurrency. You can use blockchain with dollars or any other kind. All right. So, well, again, thank you, Richard, for an excellent presentation. Um, I think a, a round of applause is in order. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So everyone is invited uh, to the uh, cocktail reception now. Uh, I'm sure uh, Rich, of course, Rich is going to stick around and, and sign the books. We'll be there, and uh, we'll be uh, networking. And one of the uh, ideas, of course, of all these events is to uh, have a networking opportunity. This is your opportunity as well. So I'll see you uh, over the uh, bar. Okay? Thanks again, Richard. Thank you.